Good morning. It is so good to see you today. Welcome to Grace Church. I'm glad that you are here. I welcome you. I want to take a moment to welcome our online church family. As always, we're glad that you're here. I also want to welcome those today who may be new. Uh, we thank you for your presence here today. And we pray that uh, through this service and everything that happens that you will experience the love of God in a very real way. I also want to take a moment to uh, welcome um, some friends who were in my youth group back in the day. <clears throat> and uh, so I would like to look at, welcome Jessica and her son Luke and Christy Burleson who are here with us here today. You know, I, 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 I was reminded of a song. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. That was a joke. When I left the church, I sang the song, Friends. Friends are friends forever when the Lord's the Lord of them. And everybody, all the girls were bawling, you know, in the group. Anyway, I'm moving on. Um, it's good to see you today on this graduation, Sunny, And we honor our graduates, uh, the, everything that they're doing. And uh, I just want you to know, as family, relatives of them, they always have a place here at Grace to call home. Um, they're writing their story. And it's a great thing. And I, I want to encourage you because we are all writing a story, aren't we? Our lives are telling a story. We're telling a story in our lives. And it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how much time you have in life. We are all telling a story. And the important thing is that we tell a good story. A story that when we look back, that will honor Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking of the thief on the cross who really didn't have any time left. <laughs> I mean, he's dying, and he ended up having a great story to tell when, I got to when he got to heaven about the grace of God and how God loved him, even though there was nothing he could do to earn God's favor. It was an amazing story. So Paul is writing to the believers in Ephesus, if you want to turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and um, he's dealing with this same kind of thing. He's wanting these uh, believers in Ephesus to tell a good story in their life. Now, he didn't phrase it that way. What he said is that he wanted them to live uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wanted them to live as children of light. Children of light. And if we are going to live as God's people, if we are going to live as children of life, light, we need the life of the Holy Spirit in us as well. And that's what I want to talk to you today about life in the Spirit. And Paul begins, and this is what he says. He says, be very careful then. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I love the way he starts that. He says, be very careful. Have you ever had a glass in your hand, something made of glass, and you dropped it, and it just broke into shards all over the place? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and it goes everywhere. And if someone... You get some of this stuff cleaned up, and if someone comes walking into the kitchen where you dropped it, what do you tell them? They're like, hey, be careful, right? Because I dropped some glass here. You need to be careful where you step it. I've got up the big pieces, but there may still be some shards left that you don't want to step on, right? It reminds me of that scene from Home Alone. Anybody love that movie, Home Alone? Where Marv is coming in through the window, and he puts his foot down, and it's right on glass ornaments. And I felt that because I remember as a kid... We had glass ornaments on our tree, and once in a while, it happened two or three times, the glass ornament broke, thought you got up all the glass, and then you step, and you're like, oh, and you got glass in your foot. So I felt that personally and deeply. deeply. Now, Paul here is not talking about where you walk. Be careful where you walk. He's talking about be careful how you walk. In other words, he's talking about our behavior. Be very ca careful, because we're not hunting rabbits, yeah, right? I'm making sure you're awake. We're not hunting rabbits. We're not trying to avoid stepping on broken glass. What we are doing is trying to live in such a way that we're avoiding things that will distract you or, or tempt you or weigh you down that will lead you astray from your faith in Christ that will cause you to compromise or cause you to fall asleep at the wheel in your spiritual life. So he says, be very careful then how you live. He is talking about our ethical, our moral behavior, how we live. And what does he say? How should we live? Not as what? Unwise. See, now, I just, if, you, if you're new, I want you to know I, I like a little bit of 
interaction here, okay? And it's okay if you respond when I ask a question like that, okay? So don't be afraid. All right, everyone okay? All right, not as unwise, but as wise, as wise. And, and this is very important because when we hear unwise and wise, we might think of intelligence, you know, smart and dumb. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. There's a couple verses let me share with you. The first is in Proverbs 1.7. And well, I'll show you that it really isn't dealing with knowledge. It's not dealing with intelligence or stupidity. It's dealing with how we live our lives, our behavior. Proverbs 1.7 says that the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. And then Psalms 14.1 says this. It says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So there is a complete distinction between what the Bible says is a wise person and a person who is a fool. A wise person lives their lives in the reality that God exists. So it impacts how they live. Make sense? I mean, let's be honest with you. If we all really genuinely believed that how we live our life matters because one day we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our life, don't you think it might change some people's behavior? Maybe ours too. I'm moving on. So the word fool in the Bible in the Old Testament actually speaks about people who lack a moral compass. They, they lack moral direction in their life. And, and it's not because there's not a, a morality that's evident that God has made known. They're just ambivalent towards it. So we need to be very careful about how we live. Why? Paul says because the days are evil. The days are evil. Now, this is an important understanding about uh, Jewish thought and belief. They believe that there were two ages. There's the age we live in now, which is considered like the present evil age. And then there is the age to come, which is eternity. And so when Paul says the days are evil, he is speaking about the fact that we live in a time where the days are evil. What does he mean by that? This is important to understand especially if we want to understand what God's redemptive history is and what he accomplished for us in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that there aren't good things in the world. It doesn't mean that there aren't good things in life. The days are evil if we say we, we live in this present evil age. It means simply that we live in a time, in an age, that is governed by sin and death. That's what it means. Now, how many have experienced sin? How many have sinned? That was it. Now we're getting, come on, Peter McGrath, raise your hand. Now I know, I know, there we go. Yeah, not too proud though, brother, not too proud. That's a sin. <laughs> it, no, we, we, we know because we've experienced it. We, we, we have sinned, we have done things that we know are wrong. Nobody, even if you don't believe in Jesus, there is nobody who, other than Jesus who perfectly lived up to what they said they believed. Nobody does. We don't. So it, this is the age that we live in. And, you know, we are created in the image of God. You and I. There's not a person, I, I put this in the devotional last week, there's not a person in whose eyes we'll look into that God doesn't love because God creates everyone in His image. But we live in an age where sin and death reign. And there is something within our hearts without Christ that tends, that has a propensity towards that kind of wrong and sin. So the days aren't evil because there's bad things in the world. There's bad things in the world because the days are evil. The age we live in is evil. We live in a time where sin and death have dominion. And how many know that's true? We live in a time where sin and the consequences of sin, death, happen. But thank God Jesus came, amen? Amen. Now, I know this goes against the general feeling that people have, when, and I understand this, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad or horrible about yourself. If, if you go, well, I'm a good person, I, I'm not trying, you know. And we live in a time where everyone likes to look in the mirror and go, well, I'm a good person, I do good things. But this is so important understanding redemption. I have to take a moment to tell you this. C.S. Lewis said this, and it's, it's so true. He said, Jesus Christ did not say, go into all the world and tell the world that it is quite right. That's not what he told us to do. Oh, everything's quite right. No, we know. Is everything quite right in the world? No, no. I mean, it's evident. Our own experience tells us that the world is not quite right. There's something wrong in the world. And I know, again, that this goes against how people generally like to see themselves. I'm good. I'm a good person. But let me ask you a question. If we are good, 
if we really, hear me on this, please. If you don't listen to anything else, I say, hear this one part right here, and then you can tune me out, okay? If we really are good, if we really are good, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? And some people say, well, that was an example of God's love for us. And it certainly was, no, no doubt. But let me bring this home a little bit to try to explain what I'm talking about. If I am in danger, I'm doing something and I am in danger, and you come to rescue me, and in the process you give up your life so that I can live, is that an act of love? Yes. Now, if I'm in a house and it's burning to the ground and I get out and everybody's out of the house and you go running in and die, is that an act of love? Is that an example of love? No, but that's stupidity. Why would you run into a house that's burning up when there's nobody in there? There's, you, there's no danger. There's nothing that needs to be rescued. You, you threw away your life recklessly. Now think about it this way. If we have done things that have put ourselves in danger of judgment and eternal separation from God, but Jesus comes and He offers His life and He pays the penalty for our sin, is that love? Yes. And that's so important. And it's not just love. It's an almost incompre incomprehensible love. If, if we just try to leave the death of Christ on the cross as an example of love, it is an example, but it's more than an example. He died to save us because we needed saving. He did what we could not do ourselves. And this is so important. And here's, here's, here's the other part I want you to tune in, and then you can tune out if you want to, okay? Thinking about our goodness. Our goodness may be the biggest hindrance to understanding who Jesus is and why He came. Our goodness. Well, I'm a good person, right? And good people, do they need grace? I'm asking a question. I'm not angry. I'm not thumping. All right? I'm not, I, but do you hear what I'm saying? Do good people need grace? Well, ultimately, yes, we do. That's correct. But if we're a good person, well, we don't, we, it's bad people that need grace, right? It's bad people, and I mean, kids know this. Well, I'm a good kid. I, what, do I, what do I need grace for? I'm a good kid. But we all need grace, and the, the thing that we don't understand, that we don't realize, and this is where our goodness gets in the way of understanding who Jesus is and what he did for us, is that our goodness, no matter how good it is, is never good enough. And that's why Jesus had to come and offer his life. We are spiritually lost apart from Jesus, but we are loved beyond measure by him. And when you look at the cross, that's what the message of the cross is. So my point isn't that, you know, you and I, that you are horrible, despicable people. That's not my point, okay? My point is, is that we're hopelessly spiritually lost. And we can't find our way home and get back to God on our own. And what we could not do, God sent Jesus to do. Jesus came to save us because of God's love. And when we, when we, what we cannot fully comprehend in God's love, we can see it demonstrated on the cross for us. And how many know sin is good, right? Isn't it? I mean, you don't sin because it feels bad, right? Doesn't it feel good to sin? Come on. It does. It feels good to sin. I mean, there, it, there wouldn't be any temptation if it didn't feel good. But it has damning consequences. And if you've sinned against somebody and you've realized it, you felt horrible about it, didn't you? If, if someone sinned against you, you felt horrible because of what they did. So Jesus came to save us because all of us were sinners. There's, I mean, we all are as we stand before him. We can't save ourselves. See, the scriptures, Jesus said this. He said he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life as a ransom for you and I. He came to redeem us. 
through his sacrifice. And this is so important because we're talking about living in the Spirit. And you're going like, well, where was living in the Spirit in this? Here's where it connects, okay? Life in the Spirit is redemptive. What Jesus accomplished on the cross is made real in us by the Spirit of God. Do you, do you hear me? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus went back to heaven, but he sent the Holy Spirit to the earth to do in our hearts and lives what Jesus accomplished on the cross. So life in the Spirit is a redemptive life. And so Paul says that we are to live very carefully, not as unwise, but as wise, because the days are evil. Another translation says that we are to redeem the times because the days are evil. Now here's what happens for us, and this is why Paul is telling them to be very careful how they live. When you read Israel's history in the Old Testament, you find out that in um, 686, uh, 686, am I right? No, 586 B.C., that uh, they had been exiled into Babylon, and, and they had taken the people of Israel, those that they li- let live, they, they took them captive, and they brought them into the land of Babylon. And why did they do that? Well, they did this for this purpose, because they wanted the Israelites to assimilate into Babylonian culture. They didn't want the Israelites to keep their own culture. They wanted, to lo- they wanted the Babylonians wanted Israel to lose its identity as God's redemptive people. Now, this is so important because of this. Paul says to live as wise, not as unwise, because there is pressure. There are things happening in our culture, and culture wants to assimilate us into its, it, the way it is and to leave behind our identity as God's redemptive people. And we can't allow that to happen. And that's why Paul says to live as wise, not as unwise. The days are evil. And you know what that means? Evil days doesn't mean... Have you ever ever seen a a Christian who's like, I'm so done with the world, it's going to hell in a handbasket, I'm just through with it. Anybody ever seen a Christian that way? I have. I've been in church a long time. I've seen a lot. I've seen some Christians that are that way. That's not the way we're supposed to be. I mean, hello, Jesus died on the cross for the world, right? So evil days are actually opportunities for redemption. God redeemed us through Christ, and now we are agents of redemption, able to participate during these evil days to share the love of God, to share the love of Jesus, to tell people about Jesus, so that they can be reconciled to their Father in heaven. Do you understand we get to participate in what God is doing in the world? Isn't that amazing? Y'all don't sound very excited about it. Jesus said this about his followers. We're going to get to a couple other verses soon, okay? But here's what he said. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And he said, you are the light of the world. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment, okay? You are the salt of the earth. Would you personalize that and just say it? I am the salt of the earth. Would you say that? I am the salt of the earth. And, and now let's personalize you are the light of the world. Say that. Say, I am the light. Don't get a God complex. Okay, this isn't God complex stuff. But this is who we are. I am the light of the world. That's what Je- Jesus said you are, so it's okay to say, well, I'm the light of the world. That's what I'm supposed to be. You know, it, it tells us something about our purpose and how we should be living our lives. Salt has a purpose. It seasons. And it, anybody like putting salt on your food? Man, you know, I've said this before, but the potato salad needs some salt, right? And corn on the cob, you get that nice, rich butter on there, but it still needs some salt. It's good. It salts, it seasons, it flavors. It also purifies and it preserves. And light has a purpose. Light shines, right? It helps people to see. Otherwise, without light, we are left in the darkness. Now, so Jesus told us, he said, be salt, be light, That's your purpose. Well, how should I live? Be salt, be light. That's what Paul says. Therefore, because the days are evil, he's talking about, verse 17, do not be foolish. Don't be different than salt and light. Rather, be salt and light. Understand what the Lord's will is. God has a will for your life. Being salt and light is part of that will. And again, he's speaking about our moral and ethical behavior. And Paul ties that in in the very next verse, verse 18. He says... 
Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Don't you love that word, debauchery? Apparently not. Okay. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. I mean, it doesn't sound, it's, it's a great sounding word with it that doesn't have a good th- reality. But he says, instead be filled with the Spirit. Anybody been around someone that's been drunk on alcohol? What, what do you notice? And other people can revi- re- uh, act in a variety of ways. I've seen people act completely dumb. People who can't sing think they're the crooner. Uh, I've seen people get just super friendly, cry. I've seen people who, who get angry. Almost killed us in a car accident driving. Why does that happen? Because they are under the influence of the alcohol. What's in control? Are they in control? No. The alcohol is in control. And Paul says that when we allow ourselves, we live in a culture that really enjoys, I'm I'm not preaching against alcohol, I'm talking about drunkenness. Everybody with me on this? All right. We live in a culture that really ties deeply into this and, and looks to alcohol. There's nothing, if you want to celebrate, that's you, 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 fine. But if you're talking about getting drunk, I, look, I remember parties in high school. I remember people waking up. What did I do? I don't remember. Ha, you were so funny. What did I do? Worshiping at the feet of the porcelain god. Great times. Can't wait to do it next week. Okay, makes no sense to me, but anyway, it leads to debauchery. It leads to a lifestyle where it's contrary to what God wants for us. We live senselessly. We live recklessly, giving no thought to our actions. And what's interesting is Paul compares, do not get drunk on wine, or contrast, I should say, get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. See, life in the Spirit is life under the influence, the control of the Spirit. That's what it means to be, to have the life of the Spirit. Anybody ever been stopped at a police checkpoint? What are they checking? Your license, insurance, registration, check your tags, make sure it isn't expired, right? But what else do they check? Make sure somebody's not driving under the influence. I mean, we even have that in our words. We, you get a DUI. You're driving under the influence of alcohol. We are not supposed to be DUIs. We're supposed to be driving under the influence, living our lives under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he says, be filled with the Spirit. Did you know that's a command? If you're a believer in Jesus, how should you be living your life? Filled with the Spirit. That's how you and I should be living our lives. Uh, in, uh, Timothy Keller said it this way. He said, the resurrection of Christ is not a stupendous magic trick, but an invasion. And the event that saved us, the movement from the cross to resurrection, now remakes the lives of Christians from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who who draws us to Christ, who regenerates us so that we become born again, believers in Jesus, gives us a new nature and a desire to follow after the Lord. So the Christian life is a Spirit-filled life. It is a Spirit-fueled life. Two years ago, I bought a truck, a brand new truck. And it came, it was a nice truck, still have it, came with a full tank of gas. You know what happened? I drove that thing for about five days, and you know what I had to do? I had to put more gas in it. You know why? Because if I didn't, it wouldn't go anywhere. It wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't fulfill its purpose. Does this, do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, and it, listen, it cost way too much just to sit and collect dust, right? Yeah. Well, listen, you cost way too much to be a Christian who sits and collects dust, And just as our body needs fuel to go, just as our vehicle needs fuel to go, guess what we need spiritually? We need to be filled, other verse, with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who fills us and empowers us to live out the purpose of God in our lives. And the thing is, this is true for all of us. There are times that our tank runs empty. Have you ever been spiritually just empty, dry? Anybody? 
Life has been hard. You've been going through things. You're worn out. You're worn down. And if you had a spiritual gauge, it would be like this. It'd be at E. Or for those who push it, under E. (laughs) Right? Running on fumes. Jesus on a feast in John 7.37 said this. He says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Spirit. Do you understand that God gave us his Spirit to well up within us and to fill us, to renew us, to refresh us? Because he knows that there's challenges in life. He knows their difficulty. See, and I, listen, I know that some of you here, like my wife, you like to ride as close to E as you can before filling back up. But we can't live the Christian life that way. And we're not called to as believers in Jesus. We need to take the lesson from our vehicles and stop running on fumes, right? What does it look like when we're running dry? I will simply say this. There is a noticeable lack of joy. There is a lack of hope. There's a lack of peace. We become fearful and anxious. We lose contentment. We grumble and complain. We make some bad decisions. And the worst thing that we can do is we can begin to look to something else to fill us where that emptiness is in us. Instead of turning to the Lord and saying, God, fill me. I'm aching, I'm hurting, I'm weary, I'm dry. Fill me. They are all a sign that our tank is on E and that you need to be filled again with the Spirit. And I know, listen, sometimes the journey is challenging. You face difficulties and troubles, struggles. You face hardships and and our resources give out, our strength gives out. But here's the beautiful thing. There is no lacking God. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Why? Because the shepherd has everything that I need to live my life and to face whatever's coming my way. In Ephesians 15, uh, 5 verses 19 and 20, I'm going to I'm wrapping up here. Y'all happy about that? I'm wrapping up? Okay. You can say okay. That's okay. I'm not offended. Some say this is uh, how you get filled with the Spirit, or this is what, and some people translate this and say this is what it looks like when you're filled with the the Spirit. Listen to what Paul says. He says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one thing I want to point out to you here. First it begins and it says what? Speak to one another. We need one another. We aren't called to live life alone. We need one another. And we are not called to live the life of faith alone. We need one another. We are to do this with one another. We are to speak, sing, make music, give thanks with one another. We need to one another, one another. We need that. And, And it's interesting because he says, let Jesus, really is what he's saying, let Jesus be the topic of your conversation. Let Jesus be the song in your heart. You ever wake up with a song in your heart? I, I had one, my son had been playing a lot of Foreigner. You know, they're on their supposedly final concert tour and I kept waking up, Blue Monday, Blue Monday. And I'm like, get this song out of my head. And so I started intentionally singing other songs to get the song out of my head. And please, God, don't let it come back into my head again. But, you know, sing and make music in your heart. Let Jesus be the thoughts in your mind. Instead of running around and chasing the what is and what could be, say, you know what? Take captive those thoughts and bring them obedient to Jesus. And say, Jesus, I'm bringing them to you. And I'm coming to you. The psalmist said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He said, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. He said, sing to Him. Sing unto Him. Sing of His goodness. Remember His faithfulness. 
Think about his love. Proclaim his greatness. Rejoice in his mercy. And listen, if, if you're spiritually, your tank is on E, let me ask you this. If you are married, if you are married and you hit a lull, in your, anybody hit a lull in your marriage before? Every once in a while, thank you. Yes. Yeah, we hit lulls in the marriage. I mean, and when you get married, you hit. I mean, it's like, it's like honeymoon, and what in the world just happened, right? You, you hit some rough spots, and you hit some hard times, and what do you do? In the, the sparks are not flying, you know? What do you do? You begin to prioritize one another, right? You prioritize one another. You make time for one another. You begin to spend more time together. What are you doing? You are building intimacy and intimacy fuels the fire of your marriage and brings life to it it stirs the embers it adds fuel to the flame you're come on alive right and it causes love to burn brighter and stronger sometimes we need to do that in our spiritual walk yes lord listen if you are tired and weary if you are worn can I encourage you to pray? Prioritize your relationship with the Lord. If you are struggling, pray. If you are joyless and hopeless, pray. If you find yourself looking to other things to try to fill and to satisfy you, pray. Increase your intimacy with God. Prioritize your relationship with Him because He has prioritized you. Scripture says, draw near to God, and what will He do? He will draw near to you. Read the Scripture. Spend time in prayer. Step out in faith. Spend time. Renew your heart and mind. Ask, seek, knock. Know this, that the Lord has not abandoned you. He's not left you. Turn to Him. Seek His face. Lean on Him. Trust Him. Call out to Him. Spend time. Have you ever just at home... Just stopped and said, God, you know, I just want to thank you. I want to worship you. I worship you because of who you are. I thank you for your goodness and love. And just, it, it, nobody else is around, but you're just having your own private little time with God where you're recognizing who he is. You're recognizing his great worth. You're recognizing what he has done for you. And you're just beginning to pour out your heart to him. And then you begin to open up and share with him about the things that are happening in your life. And there's something that happens in those moments how God can meet us there. Be grateful. Find something to express gratitude and thanksgiving. You know what it's like on a hot summer day. You've been out maybe working or playing. You've been sweating like crazy and you come in and you are just dying of thirst. And there's only one thing that satisfies, and it's not a cold Coke or Pepsi. It's really not sweet tea. You want water, ice, some ice cold water to, to give to your weary, quenched soul. You want that refreshing water to satisfy you. David was in a place where he felt that way, quenched, and he, he, was, he was thirsty, he was dry, he was parched. And he writes in the Psalms and he says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul, Lord, longs after you. Don't look to things that only temporarily satisfy you. Look to the one who created you in his image, who loves you who gave His Son for you and allow Him to fill you with His Spirit to satisfy your soul. See, Jesus invites you. If you're parched, if you're thirsty, if you're weary, if you're tired, He says, come and drink from the water and you'll never thirst again. He can refresh you, He can renew you, and He can satisfy your soul. I want to pray for you today. Would you bow your heads? Are you tired, weary? Are you worn? 
Is your soul thirsty? Has your Christian walk become kind of a grind? Just kind of going through the motions. Today, would you call out to the Lord? He will meet you right where you are. Ask Him to fill you, to satisfy you. Heavenly Father, we come today. And there are many good things in this world that we can find happiness and joy in. But God, our souls were ultimately created. Our spirits were ultimately created for you. And it's really only in you, what you have done for us in Jesus, that our soul finds satisfaction, that our soul is satisfied. And Father, I know there's some here today that are hurting, that are struggling. Inside, they're dry, they're weary, they are parched. And I pray, Father, today you would meet them right where they are. And by the Holy Spirit, you would bring refreshment and renewal into their lives. And that you would do what only you can do. And that is truly satisfy our souls. Forgive us for looking to other things. Help us to only look to you. The one who loves us. And Jesus who gave his life for us. Thank you for loving us so much. And Father, if there's anyone here today who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who has not professed him, who is not following him, I pray today would be the day that you would do that and that you would meet them and you would change and transform their lives by your grace. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.